Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everybody this is dr vishal trivedi from department of biosciences and bioengineering iit guwahati and let's continue our discussion about to uh, how to generate the uh, genetically modified organism and in this discussion uh, in the previous uh, modules what we have discussed we have discussed about the host as well as uh, in the previous module we have also discussed about the different types of vector which people are using for prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic system. During that discussion, we have discussed about uh, the uh, plasmids which are being uh, used in the bacterial expression system. Then we have used about the uh, yeast, uh, uh, yeast vectors which are uh, being used for uh, overexpression of protein in the yeast. And then we have also discussed about the mammalian expression vectors as well as the macrophage or the baculovirus vectors. And during this discussion what we have discussed, we have discussed about the many features which these vectors are providing to the uh, user and you, based on these features people can develop different types of strategies to clone the foreign gene into the, uh, into the vectors and then they can use these uh, uh, vectors for uh, uh, over expressing the foreign gene into the host. So, what we have discussed uh, from the host is that how to isolate the gene and then what we have discussed from the vector side is how to process these vectors and to generate the sticky ends. So, you, uh, you, have, gen you have isolated the gene from the vector, you have generated the sticky ends by the help of the restriction enzymes. Similarly, you have isolated the plasmids or the vectors of the different uh, eukaryotic system. You have also generated the similar type of sticky ends using the uh, same set of restriction enzymes. Then you have put them into the ligation reactions and that is how you have generated a chimeric plasmids or the chimeric DNA. And the next step is that you put these chimeric DNA into the host of your choice, either it is the bacteria which we are depicting in this figure or it could be the eukaryotic cell such as yeast or the mammalian cells. Once you insert these into the uh, host cells, then the host cell will take up this particular recombinant DNA uh, and start expressing the, uh, the foreign gene what you have put inside the uh, plasmids. So, in the today's lecture what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss about the different methods of entry of this recombinant DNA into the host species. And when we talk about the entry of a foreign DNA into the host, what we have to consider before to design a delivery method is uh, that what is the surface chemistry of the host as well as what is the kind of uh, 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 what is the kind of recombinant DNA you are uh, uh, trying to deliver into the uh, host cells. So, as I said you know you have a, a host cell which is actually called as the host cell and you have the recombinant DNA which is present in the outside. What is the uh, goal is that you take this uh, ho uh, recombinant DNA and put it into the host cells. For that you have to have the clear knowledge about the surface chemistry of the host cells because the surface chemistry will allow or will attract this particular recombinant DNA for entry into the host cells and also the surface chemistry will, uh, will either attract or to repel and accordingly you have to devise or you have to treat the host cells in such a way so that it will start express, accepting the uh, uh, the uh, foreign DNA or the recombinant DNA. For example, in the case of bacteria, you have a very thick cell wall 
uh, which is also in the case of uh, yeast as well as the plant. So, when you design the strategies for these kind of uh, host cells, you have to encounter uh, additional physical barrier which will going to hinder into the uptake and the entry of DNA. So, this is the part of the host cells where you are actually going to work on to the surface chemistry so that the surface chemistry will facilitate the entry of the recombinant DNA. Whereas, on the, on the DNA part, the DNA is as you know that DNA is negatively charged. So, negatively charged ions are going to uh, uh, will, will interact with the host cells, but you have to modulate these charges also to facilitate the better uh, entry of the recombinant DNA into the host. But the, con the, the, the first and the most important question is how the concept of delivery of DNA into the back into the host cell came off. So, this actually came off from the uh, many observation where people have found that the one bacteria or one particular host cell is exchanging its material with the uh, with the neighboring cell and with this or the neighboring uh, organisms which are falling into the same species and by doing do so they are actually exchanging the, uh, the good character or they are exchanging the phenotypic, uh, they are also bringing the phenotypic changes into the colony. Let us take an example. For example, you have the two bacterial species, one is uh, this is the first bacterial species which actually contains a plasmid which is actually providing the resistance for the ampicillin. Okay? And this particular acceptor uh, bacteria, which is actually the bacteria number 2, which is also present in the colony, both are these bacteria are belonging to the same species or similar kind of species. For example, this is also E. coli and the other one is also E. coli. So, uh, whereas it is not very important that both are belonging to the E. coli, the only thing which matters actually between the donor cell as well as the acceptor cell is that the surface chemistry or the surface chemistry should be identical and the DNA what they are going to exchange with them is going to be compatible. For example, you might have this, you might have remember that we have discussed in the past about the restriction methylase system. So, the restriction methylase system of this bacteria and the restriction methylase system of this bacteria should be identical otherwise the DNA what you are putting into the acceptor cell will not going to survive and will be degraded by the restriction methylase system of the acceptor DNA, acceptor cell and that is why the donor cell and the acceptor cell should be of the similar species so that their restriction methylase system should be very much compatible with each other and that is how they will allow the propagation of the external DNA into the cell. So, you can imagine that the you have two bacteria, one is E. coli which is actually resistance for ampicillin and this ampicillin resistance could be because it has a plasmid which is having the ampicillin resistance gene. So, what will happen is this plasmid it will going to uh, throw into the environment and then this plasmid is going to be taken up by the acceptor cell uh, although the mechanism is not known, but that is how now, this bacteria which was actually sensitive in the beginning, now it has accepted a resistance, ampicillin resistance uh, plasmid and now it is all, it has also uh, acquired the resistance for the ampicillin. This is just an example for uh, the resistance against the uh, antibiotics. It could be something else also, it could be that this bacteria has the enormous capacity to withstand the high temperature and that high temperature withstands uh, is because it is actually expressing some of the unique proteins which are uh, which are protecting this bacteria under the high temperature conditions and those things also those kind of factor also may be being produced by the extra chromosomal DNA which is present in this donor cell and by doing so it actually can confer this bacteria also to uh, uh, to withstand the high temperatures. So, 
it is not important that it is always been for the um, for the antibiotic resistance or it is always for the resistance against some kind of the external agent. It could be for, uh, uh, any kind of feature for example, this bacteria might be uh, doing the sporulation better and this bacteria may not be and this bacteria will provide the factors which will facilitate this kind of additional feature to the acceptor cells and that is how the bacteria are actually exchanging their genetic material between the two cell and that is how uh, it is always been advisable you, when you are working in your laboratory that you should destroy the bacterial uh, bacteria what you are using before you discard them into the uh, sink or before you discard them for the uh, for you know when you throw them into the dustbin because all these bacteria are having the uh, extrasomal DNA which is like in the form of plasmids and these uh, bacteria are which we, we are actually generating genetically modified could be potential target or could be potential source of spreading that particular type of phenotype into the, uh, the bacteria which is present in the environment. And that is why it is advisable that when you discard any of these recombinant DNA containing bacteria or yeast or mammalian cells, you should destroy them and that process you what you is called as the inseration, which means you have to inserate your bacterial plates or you have to uh, de inactivate the bacteria which is present in the culture media before you throw them into the sink for so that it will go into the environment, but it should not uh, contaminate the environment so that the other bacteria will take up. Okay. How this is being discovered is that there is a history about this. So, this process of this uh, bacteria uh, uh, receiving the genetic material from the other bacteria is called as the transformation and the, uh, the process of transformation is being discovered by the scientist known as the Frederick Griffith in 1928. What Frederick Griffith has done is he has taken the four different strains of the bacteria which is called as the Streptococcus pneumonia. So, Streptococcus pneumonia he has taken the four strain one is called as the uh, virulent strain or the S strain. The virulent strain is causing the disease and that actually is causing the death of the mice. And then he has also taken a avulent strain, avulent strain or the R strain. The avulent strain is incapable of causing the disease or the death of the mice. So, what you can see is that he has done the experiment in four phases. In the first phase, what he has done is he has taken the live um, uh, virulent strain, S strain, and then he has injected those live strain to the mice. And what you can see is that mice has developed the disease and ultimately the mice died. Now, he has done another experiment. What he has done is he has taken the same virulent strain as a strain and then he has done the heat killed. So, by doing the heat killing, it, he has inactivated those bacteria and then when he has killed, when he has injected those heat killed bacteria, he, those mice did not develop the disease and they were actually survived and they were living. In the second third third set of experiment, what he has done is he has done he has taken the live a virulent strain or the R strain, and since these are the non virulent strain, it has been injected into the mice. And what he could find is that these non virulent strain are not developing the disease, and since they are not developing the disease, uh, uh, these mice are also been survived. Now, in the fourth set of experiment, what he has done is he has taken the non virulent strain. So, non virulent strains are not killing the mice or they are not developing the disease, and then he has mixed the heat killed virulent strain along with the non virulent strain. So, in the fourth set, what he has done is he has taken a mixture of live virulent, a virulent strain and the heat killed virulent strain and mixed them together and injected that to the mice and what he could find is that although he has taken the live non virulent strain, the mice has developed the disease and it has caused the death of that particular mice. Similarly, uh, so it has caused the death of the disease, uh, the, the mice. What they have also found is 
when we they have isolated the bacteria from these killed uh, mice, they could not find the non virulent strain. What they could found is that it actually contains the S strain instead of R strain. So, this S strain was live S strain, which means the live non virulent strain has taken up the DNA or the transforming agents from the virulent strain and that is how the non virulent strain becomes the virulent strain and that is how it has developed the disease into the mice and that is how it has caused the death of the mice. So, these factor what they have made the non virulent strain to the virulent strain is called as the transforming agent or and so at the time of Griffith's uh, uh, time in 1928 Griffith has termed these agent which are converting the non virulent strain to the virulent strain as the transforming agents and he proposed that it could be DNA or the protein. But later on people have done the similar kind of experiment and they have figured out that it is actually the DNA which is actually being transferred from the virulent strain to the non virulent strain and that is how the mice has developed the disease and he died. So, by doing this simple experiment the Frederick Griffith has postulated the concept of transformations and that is how he has uh, he has termed these agents which are bringing or which are making the non virulent strain to the virulent strain as the transforming agents and that is how the people have uh, uh, developed the concept of transformations. So, in a in a typical transformation what is the mechanism of transformation? Uh, you have a donor cell ok. So, donor cell is actually giving the DNA or giving the recombinant DNA. These recombinant DNA are uh, going to the uh, membrane. So, these DNA could be of uh, fragments or uh, which be, which will be coming out from these donor cells either by the chemical lysis or by the mechanical lysis or by the uh, cell lysis either by the chemical or the mechanical means. So, this DNA is present in the environment. Now, this DNA is being uh, so one strand of this DNA is going to be degraded and then the, the DNA will be taken up by uh, will bind to the competent recipient cells. So, uh, we have already discussed about what could be the competent cells, competent recipient cells, the competent recipient cells are the those cells which are not going to degrade this DNA and by doing so, this DNA will enter into the into the uh, competent cells and then it will integrate along with the genome and that is how that uh, the recipient cells also will confer the similar kind of features what this DNA is encoding for and that is how you are going to get the transformed cells. So, that is what is, is given here that transformation is the process by which the cell free DNA is taken up by another bacteria. The DNA from the donor bacteria binds to the competent recipient cells and the DNA enters into the cell. The DNA enters into the recipient cells through a uncharacterized mechanism. So, the mechanism by how this DNA enters into the competent recipient cell is still not known and the DNA which, which is present as a single, uh, uh, single uh, uh, DNA or single strand is get integrated into the chromosomal DNA of the recipient bacteria through a homologous recombinations and uh, it is always been observed that the natural transformation which occurs between the donor as the recipient cells is always been between the related species and we have already discussed about the uh, why, why it is so because the, the closely related species are going to have the similar kind of restriction modification system. So, as soon as the DNA will enter into the uh, recipient cells it is not going to be degraded and that is how it is going to get a chance to go to the chromosome and then it will integrate into the chromosome by a homologous recombinations. Now, uh, as, is, as we discussed in the past that you have to prepare a, uh, the competent recipient cell. So, what is mean by competent recipient cell is the cell which is ready to receive the uh, ready to receive the uh, the DNA 
and this is always been done by treating the cell bacterial cell or treating the bacterial cell with different types of agents. These agents could be the chemical agents or the physical processes. So, you can see a small list where I have enlisted the different types of bacteria. For example, in the case of Streptomachus pneumonia, you have to treat these cells with the mitomycin C or fluoroquinolones. Similarly, in the bacillus subtilis, you have to treat them with the uh, UV light and that actually induces or that actually makes these cells uh, competent uh, to receive the DNA. Similarly, Helicobacter pylori, the bacteria which is responsible for ulcer is you have to treat it with the chemical called ciprofloxacin and the other kind of bacteria and pneumonophily which you have the chemical uh, treatment as well as the physical treatment such as UV light or hydroxyurea and in the case of E. coli you can use the calcium chloride, rubidium chloride or the magnesium chloride for uh, making them competent and uh, so how to prepare a competent cell? Uh, uh, competent cell is very simple. So, in this case uh, we have taken an example of E. coli. Uh, how you are going to prepare a competent cell is that you take a bacteria and incubate with the divalent cations such as calcium chloride, rubidium chloride for 30 minutes at 4 degrees Celsius. What will happen during when you treat the cells with the divalent cation is that this act treatment is actually making the cell wall to swell. So, it actually brings the uh, 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 some, some kind of flexibility in the cell wall and on the other hand it also gathers the factor which is required for the intake of DNA which is docked onto the plasma membrane. So, it actually doing two things. One, it is actually loosening the cell wall which is present in the, uh, in the outside. So, once the cell wall is getting loose, you have a DNA which is actually getting a chance to dock onto the plasma membrane and once it is docking, then you have actually, uh, you have put many uh, factors or by doing the treatment with the uh, divalent cation, these factors are being uh, more. So, that is how the DNA will enter into the bacterial cell and but what will is important is that when you are making these E. coli cells for competent cells or when you are treating them with the divalent cations, they actually and as, as we discussed the cell wall is going to be uh, loose or swell. So, because of doing so, it actually becomes very, very fragile. So, you have to take care of these cells after you make them a competent very, very sophisticated or you have to treat them very gently which means you are not allowed to centrifuge these cells at a very, very high speed because if you, if you, if you uh, centrifuge or if you uh, uh, spin them at a very, very high speed actually that these cells will may get damaged because the cell wall is already uh, compromised. Okay. So, cell wall is already swollen. So, that is how the protection what cell, cell wall provides for the bacteria to so withstand the different types of shear stress and different types of harsh treatment is already gone or it is actually swelled. So, you, you swell to such an extent that the plasma membrane, the DNA is getting access to the plasma membrane. So, because of that, if you spin it a very high speed, the high speed spinning is going to give them the shear stress and that actually will eventually going to lyse the bacteria. Similarly, when you have prepared these competent cells, these competent cells are going to be pipetted into the small aliquot because you have to store them uh, for long term st uh, uh, storage or for uh, you have to store them because you have to use them in a future. So, for that you have to aliquot them. Okay. That pipetting also has to be done in a gentle manner so that you should not give them the shear stress. The same thing is centrifugation also is going to give them the shear stress, pipetting is also going to give them the shear stress and these are the feature factors which are eventually going to damage these cells and eventually going to reduce the uh, ability of these cells to take up the DNA. Uh, once you prepare these, uh, once you incubate these cells with the divalent cations, they become competent, 
but you cannot use them all the cells in a one goal because you are going to prepare large quantity of competent cells uh, in single day. So, what you have to do is you have to store these cells in a in a in a buffer which contains the 15 to 20 percent glycerol and then you can store them in a minus 80 degree Celsius and now whenever you are required you can you can take out the, these cells and use them for uh, the uh, transformations. So, uh, while you are preparing the competent cells you have to be little uh, careful that what kind of the bacteria you should use. So, it is the, uh, the ability of a bacteria changes while it is going through the uh, different phases of the growth in the media and that is why it is important to choose a phase which is very very uh, efficient in take up the DNA as well as it is uh, in, uh, going to give you the better transformation. So, if you see a bacterial growth curve what you will see is that you have a lag phase then you have a log phase, then you have a stationary phase and then you have a dead phase. And all these phases we have discussed in a previous uh, lectures and their significance. So, the log phase bacteria is the bacteria which is actually very active in terms of metabolism, in terms of growth, in terms of the repair mechanism. So, these bacteria are actually very good in terms of growth, repair and they are uh, metabolically very active. So, these are the phase which you can use for making the competent cells. You cannot take the lag phase because the lag phase bacteria are is still under the stress and it is actually adjusting to the new media conditions. You cannot take the stationary phase because they do not, uh, these stationary phase bacteria are not growing or not very uh, good in terms of uh, uh, growth as well as the repair mechanisms. Death phase anyway you cannot take because those bacteria are not growing and they are in the death phase. So, the log phase bacteria is good because they are showing very uh, high growth, they are metabolically very active and the most important thing is that if you give them some kind of uh, stress or some kind of damages, they will be very good in terms of their repair mechanism. And that is why they are very good in, take in, in terms of taking up the foreign DNA. The bacteria in log phase is more active and efficient to perform the DNA damage and repair than stationary phase bacteria. As a result, it is preferred to use a bacteria of log phase for making a competent cell for transformation. And if you remember when we were discussing about the bacterial growth kinetics, we have said that you can actually uh, use the different types of growth measure, measuring methods to know when the bacteria will be in the log phase and that is how you can choose that particular time point or that particular growth period and that is how you can choose the bacteria for the making the competent cells. Uh, so, transformation is a multi step process uh, in the uh, and in the first step we have already discussed that you actually will take up the log phase of bacteria and transfer to uh, and add it to the cold calcium chloride uh, solution into a ice bag. And in the second step what you are going to do is once you are ready to take up, once you are ready to uh, do the transformations. So, the step 2 onwards whatever you do is, uh, so in the step 1 you are going to make the uh, competent cells and then you store them in minus 80 under the 15 to 20 percent glycerol. On the day of transformation what you are going to do is you take out one vial and put it into the ice buckets and then uh, you are going to incubate the uh, plasmid which you want to transform. So, in this case we have taken a plasmid which is containing the ampicillin resistance and then you incubate that with the uh, uh, with that particular plasmids in uh, ice for 30 minutes. So, on the day of transformation the competent cells are incubated with DNA or the circular plasmids containing resistance genes such as ampicillin for 30 minutes on ice. Then what you do is you go to the next step and that is called as the heat shock. So, what you will do is then you will give a heat shock at 42 degree Celsius for 90 seconds. Uh, and that actually will induce the uh, uptake of the plasmid uh, and 
what happen when you do a heat shock is that it actually relax the cell wall so it actually loosen the cell wall further and because you are putting giving a high temperature stress that actually upregulates the different types of factors which are responsible for dna recombination and repair so you are actually going to give them a very short period heat shock and because of that the bacteria will respond so first thing what will happen is the cell wall is going to be further relaxed and that actually will allow the plasmid to interact with the plasma membrane in in the heat shock process sometimes the plasma membrane also becomes slightly leaky or slightly compromised and that's how the the plasmids which are being present on to the uh, plasma membrane they get internalized into the cytosol on the other hand it actually upregulates because heat shock is giving a some kind of stress and these stress are always been associated with a downstream signaling processes and that actually upregulates many uh, type of factor to take care of this particular stress and these factors are required for dna recombination as well as for repair mechanism because you can imagine that once you have created the you know some kind of compromised cell wall you also have to seal these things you have to repair these so that the bacteria is going to close these pores or close these compromised cell wall as well as compromised plasma membrane otherwise the cytosol will leak out from those pores those those places so as soon as you have done the heat shock you are going to start these cascades of events and that actually will upregulate different types of factors so that these these damages which you have done into the bacterial cell will going to be repaired and it also going to induce the re dna recombination so that once the plasmid is inside it has a chan high chances of getting integrated into the genome now after the heat shock what you are going to do because you don't want the because if you keep, keep the heat shock very long this stress bacteria cannot survive cannot sustain and then the bacteria is going to die so you have to reverse the things so you have made the uh, cell wall leaky you have made the plasma membrane compromised plas plasmid has gone inside then what you have to do is you have to reverse the things by adding a chilled media and once you add the chilled media that actually is going to make the recovery of bacteria very fast and then that process all those pores are going to be sealed and that's how the plasmid which is present inside is going to be remain intact or remain inside then what you do is uh, you uh, uh, you take these uh, uh, cells and plate it onto a agar plate the Uh, containing the appropriate ampicillin concentration normally we use somewhere around 50 to 100 microgram ampicillin per ml so that you have to use onto this plate and then you use a spreader and you spread those plate cells or spread the competent cells onto these plates if these cells have taken up the bacteria they will acquire the resistance against the ampicillin and that's how they are going and then you incubate them in 37 degree celsius into the incubator and that's how they are going to give you the colonies the bacteria will grow and it will give you the colonies uh so in the last step you are going to plate the uh, the uh, transformed cells onto the solid media with appropriate antibiotics such as ampicillin in this case and then you allow them to grow for 18 to 24 hours and that is good enough for the bacteria to recover from the uh, stresses recover from the damages and then it will start growing and give you the colony and for practical purposes we have also going to show you a small movie clip from my lab hello everyone in this video we will show you how to prepare competent cells and transform the plasmid and plate the cells so let's start the procedure before before preparing the com cells we need some inoculum this is the dh5 alpha inoculum i'm going to inoculate in a new vial for com cells preparation so 
so i will show you how to inoculate so now i am going to inoculate the culture then we will incubate in a shaking incubator to get pine flour that is the dark phase of bacteria where we can prepare the capsules that is the good stage to transfer the culture After inoculation, now we have to keep it in incubator shaker till we get required body. So it should be 37 degrees Celsius and 150 RPM. Now we can see some growth in here. Now we have to check what is the OD of this culture. We can measure it in spectrophotometer at 600 nanometer. Now I have to take out one ml from this culture and blank against the media and then we will measure the absorbance. Zero. So this is our uh, inoculated culture. I am going to use this sample holder. Then ask it for the culture. So that OD is 0.466. It is the sufficient for our uh, capsules preparation. So we will use this culture for capsules preparation then transfer. So we got sufficient body. Uh, next we have to centrifuge the uh, culture and pellet down the cells. After that we will prepare capsules using fiber molar calcium. So I am going to uh, transfer into new centrifuge tube and centrifuge it to get the Now I am going to centrifuge the culture at uh, 4000 rpm for 10 minutes. 
so I have to get After mixing the contents in uh, cell pellet with 0.1 molar calcium chloride, we have to keep the cell suspension for half an hour. Then in sub subsequent steps, we have to centrifuge and wash with the 0.1 molar calcium chloride for another two times. After final step, we have to add 0.1 molar calcium chloride at 2 to 3 ml. We suspend gently and unquote into different drop tubes for storage. We have washed uh, in final step, so we have to mix uh, the cell pellet with the 0.1 molar calcium chloride, then we will unquote into different drop tubes for storage. Now we have imported 100 ml microliter. Now we have to store these concepts in minus 80 degrees Celsius till further use. Any mechanical disturbances or freeze time will subsequently destroy the concepts. So there is no transformation. Uh, we have to add plasmid in aseptic condition. So uh, we kept this concepts and plasma DNA inside. So now I am going to add plasma DNA. We kept uh, the competent cells with plasmid DNA for 30 minutes on ice. Now we will give uh, heat shack at 42 degrees Celsius.
We gave heat shock to the competent cells at 42 degrees Celsius and we have to keep 10 minutes on ice. Then we will add LB media, cold LB media uh, and uh, keep it in the incubator shaker. I am going to add LB media to the comp cells. After adding media to the transformed cells, we will keep an incubator shaker at 37 degrees Celsius. With a rotation speed of 150 rpm. We just transformed the plasmid DNA into calm cells. But during this procedure, we have to be cautious because any mechanical disturbance to the calm cells will lead to decrease in transformation efficiency. So, while handling the calm cells, we are not going to keep outside like uh, normal temperature. Always we will keep calm cells on M ice. So, otherwise uh, the transformation efficiency will go down. And another thing is that we should not add plasmid in uh, normal environment. We have to always keep it in aseptic condition. And also uh, during transformation, uh, Now we got sufficient growth for transformation. We will centrifuge the cells and plate them suitably. After centrifugation, we will remove all the media, but we will keep 100 microliter re the pellet and take 20 microliter and plate on agar plates. But if you are expecting low transformation efficiency, you can use all 100 microliter for plating. This is the best way to increase chances of transformation. We got a pellet, now we will take out the media and keep 100 microliters, resuspend and we will
when we have plated the cells, we will keep in the incubator for overnight. Then we will observe what is the how many colonies. Now we can see there is a colonies appeared on the transformed plate, like in, but there is no colonies on uh, only comb cells plated one. So you can see colonies here. Now we will calculate the transformation efficiency. So there is a formula for transformation efficiency, number of colonies you got on that plate and that microgram of DNA you used multiplied by final volumetric recovery how much volume you recovered that is 100 microliter for the based on your chest and how much volume plated so suppose you got 500 colonies on that plate you used 0 0.001 microgram of DNA into 100 microliter is total recovery but you plated only 20 microliter so that means you have 2500 divided by 0.001 so that will give 2.5 into 10 power 6 transformates per microgram of DNA and this is what you are going to see when you are going to do a transformation you are also going to do a control transformations where you are only going to take the competent cells alone so if you if you only plate the competent cells alone without the plasmid you are not going to see any colonies whereas if you take the competent cells uh, if for example in this case we have taken a e coli cell which is called as bl21 d3 and then we have transformed a recombinant DNA which is called as PET 23A PF14 uh, underscore 0660 and that has given the bacterial colonies uh, like the white colored uh, spots what you see is all the bacterial colonies and if you count these colonies you could be able to calculate the transformation efficiency or the efficiency of this particular processes so and this is called as the transformation efficiency so what is mean by the transformation efficiency is that the number of colony forming unit is number of colonies what are being formed obtained by transforming one microgram of plasmid into the given volume of competent cells which means the number of colonies what you are getting if you are doing a uh, one microgram of transformations into the cell and that is called as the transformation efficiency. Let us take you a, a simple data how you can calculate the transformation efficiency from this uh, from the from after your transformation because that is very important that that you are using a competent cell which is of a very high transformation efficiency. So let us see that you have transformed for example you have transformed 1 microliter of 0 0.01 nanogram per microliter plasmid into a 100 microliter of competent cells ok. So this is what you have done and then after the heat shock you have added 900 microliter of chilled LB media to these cells uh, and the total reaction volume is going to be 1000 microliters ok. Now from this 1000 microliters you have taken only 100 microliter and that you have plated onto the cell. By doing though the plate then you have plate then you have taken the plate and put it into the colony counter if you remember we have discussed about the colony counter when we were talking about the microbial growth kinetics and the number of colonies what you got in the colony counter is 450 colonies ok. So now let us see how to calculate the transformation efficiency. So the nanograms of DNA what you have plated is 1 microliter into 0 0.01 nanograms into 100 microliter into divided by 1000 ok. So this means you have actually uh, play, uh, you have transformed 0 0.001 nanogram of DNA which is very very small amount of DNA into the uh, uh, into the uh, competent cells and the number of colonies what you got is 450 colonies ok. So 450 
Now divide that by this number 0 0.0001 okay, and the number what you are going to get then you convert that into the microgram. So, to converting that into the microgram you have to multiply this number by 1000 and the number what you are going to get is 4.5 into 10 to power 8 CFU per microgram which means you this is 4.5 into 10 to power 8 is the transformation efficiency of this particular competence cell preparation what you have prepared. Okay. But the transformation efficiency is going to vary from batch to batch, from cell to cell and for and there are many factors which are affecting your transformation efficiency. It is not important that you are going to get the transformation efficiency every time identical. That is why it is important that whenever you prepare the competent cells uh, in your lab for any kind of molecular biology or recombinant DNA technology applications from the batch you should take out one vial and calculate the transformation efficiency. So, that when you are going to do the uh, transformation of the ligation products uh, you should be able to in you should be sure that the you are using the transformation you are using the competent cells which are of very high efficiency. Because when you do the ligation products you may not be even ligating 1 nanograms or less than 1 nanogram DNA and in that cases the transformation efficiency of 8 uh, 10 to power 8 or 10 to power 10 uh, CFUs per microgram is good enough to give you few colonies of recombinant DNA. So, apart from the, uh, the transformation by the chemical method you can also use the electroporation. The electroporation is a, uh, is a simple method where you know that the plasma membrane is composed of lipid and proteins and these macromolecules give the charge onto the surface or charge to the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. So, if you provide a very high electric pulse, uh, uh, if you provide a very high electric pulse to the cell, the charge actually runs across the membrane and because the charge is running and uh, uh, you have a partial charge per present on the membrane that actually disturbs the arrangement of the charge onto the membrane and that actually brings lot of pores onto the membrane and that formation of the pore onto the membrane allow the easy passage of the macromolecule especially the charged molecules like DNA into the cell. So, what you are doing is you this is the plasma membrane what you have and when you are putting uh, so this is actually having the protein and lipids and the protein because the protein and lipid it has some charge onto the membrane. But when you provide the charge to this it actually uh, swells or it actually provides the some kind of pores. So, you can imagine that some pores is going to be formed and those pores are good enough for the entry of the DNA especially the charge particles. And after the electroporations, after the electroporation the cell is allowed to recover from the damage and it will form the colony simply like the uh, uh, what we have discussed in the case of transformations. So, in a in a typical electroporation uh, you what you have to have is you have to provide the electroporation cubits and the typical electroporation cubit what you see is look like as the uh, uh, a glass uh, cubits ok. And in the glass cubit what you have is uh, like the metal plates on both sides ok and you will provide the bacterial cell here between these uh, between these plates, but the processing of this bacterial plate is going to be different from the processing what we have done for the uh, for the um, co competent cells uh, by the chemical method. In these cases as we said is that we are looking for the uh, the disturbance of the charge which is present on the plasma membrane. That is why when you do a preparation of competent cells for the electroporations the, the uh, cell should be of free of salts. So, what you are going to do is that you take up the cell you take these cells and uh, 
uh, wash with wash with uh, buffer without salt. So, that uh, is the condition that you wash these E. coli or some bacterial cell with a buffer which does not contain the salts and by doing so what you are going to do is you are actually removing the cationic as well as the anionic ions which are present onto the uh, either onto the cell wall or onto the plasma membrane so that you are not these ions should not participate into the conductance of uh, electric fields or whatever you are going to provide because that is not what is going to be we want to disturb what we want to disturb is the charge which is present on the uh, present on the plasma membrane uh, and which is being impart by the lipids at the well the protein because if you allow these uh, small ions to be present then these small ions are going to take up all the charge and they will not going to uh, pass on this charge onto the plasma membrane and as a result there will be no expansion of plasma membrane or there will be no pore formations. So, you have to wash these cells until they are free of salts and then these cells are ready for transformation. Then what you have to do is you have to open these uh, cuvettes and then you have to put your uh, cells between these two electrodes and then you have to put it into a electroporators. These electroporators are the specialized instruments which actually gives the uh, uh, current from one electrode to another electrode for a very small period of time and that is how they are actually going to give you the charge onto the bacterial cells and that is how they are going to create the pores and once the pores are being created that will take up the uh, DNA. And for practical purposes we have also going to show you a small uh, uh, movie clip from my lab how the students are performing the transformation into the E. coli. In previous video we shown that how to transform uh, plasmid DNA using calcium chloride method. In this one we will show how to use a, an electroporator for transforming DNA. So, this is the cuvette for uh, we use for electroporation. So, there are two electrodes placed and this is the sharp part. So, we will connect here like this and all the adjustments pulse how much time we have to give the pulse all these things we can set here. So, once the setting is over we can keep cells uh, along with our plasmid DNA inside and then hold and we will press pulse. So, whatever the pulse generated we have given the pulse that is generated inside and through the electrodes through the electrodes it will pass us through. For a minute fraction of time because of this uh, electric pulse the pores of uh, there are small pores formed in bacteria. If any plasmid adjacent to that uh, cell happens then it will enter inside the cell and quickly the pores are sealed. Those cells we will use for plating. So, this is all about the electroporation the transformations by the electroporation as well as the transformation by the chemical methods. Both are these methods have the uh, different types of transformation efficiency and the transformation efficiency whether it is by the chemical method or the electroporation method depend mostly on to the different factors which we are going to discuss in the next slide. So, one of the uh, crucial point is that the size of the plasmids. So, as the size of the plasmid will go up the transformation efficiency will go down. So, up to a certain size the transformation efficiency is unaffected, but if you take a plasmid of 10 kb or even more than that then the transformation efficiency will, will drastically going to go down. Then the form of DNA if you remember we have discussed we have three different forms of DNA closed circular DNA, the in open circular DNA 
and the supercoiled DNA. The supercoiled DNA is having the least surface area or it is actually the, uh, the, the most compact DNA and that is why the transformation efficiency is very high for the supercoiled DNA compared to the closed circular DNA or the open circular DNA. Then there are the uh, different, there are bacterial strains which are competent enough to take up the bacteria, uh, competent enough to take up the particular type of plasmids. For example, in the case of E. coli K12 strand, it has the 4 to 5 times more efficiency than to the similar strand without uh, the similar kind, some kind of genetic, genetic uh, uh, background. Uh, for example, for linear DNA which is poorly transformed, so compared to the closed circular DNA, you, the linear DNA is not getting transformed very efficiently in E. coli. But if you have the E. coli strain which have the uh, mutations for the these two genes REC BC or REC D, then it actually improves the transformation efficiency very significantly. Then this is already we have discussed, if you are preparing a competent cells, you always have to try to use the log phase cells. Then the methods of transformations, you have what we have discussed, we have discussed about the calcium chloride method and we have discussed about the electroporation. So cal electroporation is, uh, if you use the electroporation, it will give you more efficiency compared to the calcium chloride method. The only difference is that calcium chloride method does not require a very high end and uh, costly electroporators and it also does not require the transformation qubits. But in the case of electroporation, you require these uh, materials to perform the uh, transformations. But the transformation efficiency what you are going to get in the case of electroporator in electroporation is going to be way more compared to the calcium chloride method. Then the damage to DNA, if you expose the DNA to UV, it actually going to generate the different types of damages into the DNA and this DNA, damage DNA is not having the very high efficiency or a very high transformation efficiency. So with this we have discussed about the transformation of DNA into the bacteria. Now we are going to start with the transformation in yeast. So yeast you know is much more is a eukaryotic cell and yeast is much more complicated compared to the bacterial cell. The bacterial cell in the bacterial cell you only have the cell wall and then the plasma membrane. Once that you insert the DNA inside the plasma membrane then your job is done. Whereas in the case of yeast the it is very very complicated because you also you have a cell wall at the first place then you also have the plasma membrane and inside the plasma membrane you also have the nucleus and a transformation will be considered only when you take up the DNA and put it inside the nucleus so that it will integrate into the genome and that is how it is going to express uh, along with the genome along with the other genes which are present in the genome. So there are many methods what people are using. One of the uh, one of the classical method is called as the lithium acetate PEG method, and in this method, the yeast cells are incubated with their transformating agents, which is called lithium acetate PEG three five zero zero and single stranded carrier DNA. So this single stranded carrier DNA is required so that it actually will block the non-specific sites on the cell wall and made the plasmid available for uptake. So which means that you are adding the carrier DNA simply because you do not want your foreign DNA or the foreign uh, plasmids what you are adding for the transformation uh, should be consumed. Uh, so what you do is you incubate the yeast cells into a transformation mixture which contains lithium acetate PEG 3500 single standard carrier DNA, foreign DNA at 42 degrees Celsius for 40 minutes okay and that actually will allow the uptake of this plasmids into the cell and then once the transformation is over, the cells are palleted to remove the uh, transformation mixture and resuspended in the water. It is plated onto the solid media with 
the appropriate selection pressure such as antibiotics or some other kinds of uh, selection pressure which you uh, according to the plasmid what you have using for, uh, for the uh, after the transformations. Now, the next method is called as the, uh, the uh, spiroplast transformation methods. So, as we discussed the yeast has the cell wall and then it has the plasma membrane below that you it has a nucleus also. So, in this method the cell wall is removed partially to produce spiroplast. So, when you remove the cell wall by the treatments it is actually going to create a, 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 a some a, some kind of a, a product and that is called as the spiroplast. Once the spiroplasts, as uh, so spiroplasts, as it as we discussed, once you pre do any such kind of treatments and you remove the cell wall, the remaining cells is going to be very very fragile, and that's why it is very very fragile for the osmotic shock. Uh, but these cells are ready to take up the free, uh, free DNA at a very high rate. In addition, you also adding the polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene glycol is a is a is a substance which actually allows the uh, facilitate the uh, uh, entry of DNA as well as the carrier into the uh, into the cell and it allows the easier uptake of these uh, products. So, how to do this uh, transformations? In the first step what you are going to generate you are going to produce the spiroplasts. So, what you do is you first grow the yeast cells into the appropriate culture media, the yeast media we have discussed, YPD media and other kind of media what we have discussed in the past. So, you first grow the yeast in those media, then you did what you do is you incubate the yeast cells with an enzyme called as zymolase. So, when you treat them with the zymolase, zymolase is going to uh, remove the cell wall components and that is how it is actually going to create the uh, 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 partially degraded cell wall and it will going to produce the spiroplasts. Once the spiroplasts are being generated, then what you do is you incubate them and you collect these spiroplasts by centrifugations and then you incubate these spiroplasts with carrier DNA, carrier DNA so that you will block the sites on the cell wall as well as on the plasma membrane and as well as with the plasmids for 10 minutes at room temperature uh, that you will do in the incubator. Once you have done that, then in the third step, now you treat this particular mixture with a peg and the calcium for 10 minutes with gentle shaking and this treatment actually will allow the uptake of DNA. Now, trans now your your spiroplasts are transformed, okay. And now you what you do is you put it them into the solid media and incubate on 30 degrees Celsius for four days. So now the spiroplasts are being transformed along with the peg carrier DNA and plasmids. Then you then you plate them onto a uh, uh, appropriate uh, plates which are containing the selection pressures. So spiroplasts will grow to these plates and you grow them into the 30 degrees Celsius for 4 days. Once you grow them for 4 days, you are going to get the colonies. Uh, so, uh, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the, the entry of the DNA into the prokaryotic system as well as the eukaryotic system. In the eukaryotic system, we have taken only the examples of the yeast. And in the, in the subsequent lecture, we are also going to discuss about the entry of DNA into the higher um, uh, eukaryotic cells such as the mammalian cells, how you, what are the different strategies you have to use for getting the DNA into the mammalian cells. And with this, we would like to conclude our lecture here and in the next lecture, we are going to discuss about the entry of DNA into the higher eukaryotes such as the mammalian cells. Thank you.